Hi there, uh, my name's Dawn and I'm the artistic development producer here at the Nuffield Theatre. Uh, we're going to talk to you today about the Big Ideas Project. It's a programme we run here at Nuffield which pairs artists with academic researchers, primarily in the fields of science, technology, engineering and maths, towards the creation of exciting new pieces of theatre inspired by their research. Um, I'll be chatting with researcher Paul White and theatre company Little Bob a little bit about their process in order that we might share with you the potential value of this type of collaboration. We'll be asking the role that the arts can play in disseminating and casting new light on the big ideas happening behind closed laboratory and library doors. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Paul to talk a little bit about his research. Thank you, Dawn. So I'm Paul White. I'm an uh, academic within the Institute of Sound and Vibration Research, which is a unit within the university. Um, my interests have historically started life in signal processing, which is a, a rather dry subject around uh, using computers to analyse signals, particularly sounds, and work out what's going on. And that was work that was largely sponsored initially by the military to listen to underwater sounds, and you can imagine why the military might want to listen underwater and work out what's going on and what might be happening. When you start doing that, what you actually find is that you don't always hear those things the military are interested in. What you actually start hearing are animals making strange sounds. And you sometimes start wondering what the heck they're on about and what's going on. So that led me to an interest in marine mammals and the sounds they make and trying to understand what's going on. That happened to coincide with an upsurge in interest as we began to realise that the noise that man makes in the oceans is actually starting to produce noise pollution underwater. We're used to noise pollution in air, we're used to people living near airports, having to put up with uh, planes flying around, living near wind turbines, producing swishing noises that upset them, living near a road, etc. And the same is true underwater. The marine animals have to live in this environment where we're driving ships through that make a lot of noise. We pile drive, which makes a lot of noise. We look for oil surveys, you know, bang, 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 using seismic ships, which makes a lot of noise. And noise underwater travels a lot further than it does in air. So that problem is a real big problem that we have very little handle on. So we begin to study the effect that sounds have on animals and the animals themselves. <coughs> the piece of work that Little Bulb picked up on, and I had the joy of working with them, and it is genuinely a joy, um, that was to look at the humpback whales. So we, we do some work in Madagascar. There's a, a breeding ground up there that we, I'm lucky enough to go to every so often, where the humpbacks gather. And what happens there is really fascinating. The humpback whales have are the archetypal whale, and most, most people, if you ask them what noise does a whale make, they'll start making sort of type sounds and maybe doing impersonations of Dory from Finding Nemo. Those sounds are typically sounds that humpback whales make. And humpback whales are unique within the whale kingdom as far as we know. Everything I say throughout here will be caveated by as far as we know are the only ones that make the complex sounds that they do, the songs that the males sing. So particularly what happens is the males, the humpback whales, in the, in the winter months, move to the tropical waters from the Antarctic or the polar regions, the animals we talk about, live in the summer in the Antarctic, breed in the winter around the coast of Madagascar, and they go there and the males start singing these really quite complex songs. The songs are made up of small sounds that they glue together in patterns. So they might go, mrr, whoop, mrr, whoop, and then repeat that a few times. And then they might start going, mrr, whoop, mrr, whoop. <laughs> yeah, paid for the minute. Um, and a humpback whale, so they start producing these patterns and they repeat those patterns, which, call, which we call phrases, and then they'll have repeat phrases to create themes, and they'll repeat themes to create the whole song. And the really amazing thing is that all the male humpbacks, when they're up in the water, sing the same song. So all the humpback whales in the Madagascan population will sing a song. That song will be different to the humpback whales in other parts of the Indian Ocean. It may, it'll be different to the animals in the Pacific. It'll be different to the animals in the Atlantic Ocean. Next year, when we come to measure the sound the animals make, the males will appear, they'll start singing, and they'll be singing a song which is different. And they'll all be singing a different song. Quite how this works, we really don't understand. Whether or not there's a great Beethoven of a whale down in the Antarctic <laughs> waters that composes a sound that they all go off and sing, we don't know. So it's those sorts of ideas that fed us to work with Little, little Bulb, and they're going to explain a bit about their experience. Yeah, guys, so do you want to tell us a bit about um, 
how you started embarking on a project like this and making sense of that research. Um, yes, thank you. Well, we um, Little World Theatre and we're a devising theatre company, which basically means we make everything up. Um, normally what we, <laughs> we do is we, we start with a question um, or it might be an image that we want to, to see or perhaps an atmosphere that we want to explore. So for, for this project, we, we were asking ourselves the question, why is it that the, the whales are singing? Um, and basically what we'll start to do is create a, a unique world for each show. Um, and that's not just a world for us as the performer, but it's, it's a world for the audience as well. So we really like the idea of inviting the audience into a world. So we start creating lots of bits of material that might be songs, bits of performance. And we're <clears throat> these are just very broad brushstrokes. We, we're not too worried about if they're good or bad, because then we get to our next phase, which is maybe our scientific phase, Paul. I don't know <laughs> if you'd agree with this. But um, <laughs> we put our science hats on and we, we really start tinkering with the material. And what we're basically asking is, how authentic is this material in the world? Does it truly belong in the, in the world? And if it does belong, how do we make it better? And one of the things that we're always sort of coming back to in our work is this question of music and the relationship of music with, with, with people. And that's just something that we all love playing music and, and singing songs. So it's a, it's a big sort of theme of our, our work. And um, that was a really obvious parallel with Paul's work. Uh, so we started by asking him loads of questions about the song cycle of the humpback whale. And the way Paul described it was, was very humorous and very human. So it became very clear to us how, how we could turn that into a theatrical production. We, we started with all the basic questions, establishing that it's mainly, well, it's just the males that sing these specific songs. And then we got into all the nitty gritty of what is known and what isn't known about their songs. And we took that all into our rehearsal space and began coming up with some materials. So we were writing songs about whales and trying to recreate the sounds of the whales using our voices and using instruments. And Claire and I started learning the trombone because we found that that was the best instrument for sounding like a whale. And it's really convenient because it actually sounds quite a lot like a whale, even if you're not very good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so. We started coming up with that kind of material and then reflecting back on the question that we often come back to as to why humans sing and placing those two questions alongside each other. And what we ended up with is a, a piece which is part comedy, part gig, part scientific lecture. And that is quite a new genre for us. And, and maybe indeed for the world. <laughs> um, but uh, we, we were, felt really free to do whatever we wanted. We didn't have to kind of do a science lecture as a theatre show, but that's what came out. And we could have done, you know, if we wanted to, a 20-minute interpretive dance show about how you feel when you see a whale, which maybe is next year's uh, project, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but no, it was really nice to have um, been allowed to go behind one of the thousands of doors in this university where there's all these amazing things going on that we would have never known anything about. Um, and I... I mean, myself personally, I've seen a whale, but I didn't, and I think I know a, a children's book called Whale Song, and thought, oh, okay, a yeah, whale sing. But that's as much as I knew, and I just like that idea, but I think that's maybe what everybody knows, and the, the specifics of it, that the fact it was only the males, and the fact that it changes every year, it was all completely new to us, and we found all these facts so fascinating, we were like, okay, well, yeah, let's, let's share those facts and, in this exciting way, and I think everybody comes at things from a different um, perspective and angle. So, you know, life is so busy doing things like washing up and taxes that you might not have the time to go into a library and go, I'm just going to go into a, a, the section about marine biology and discover this today. But you might come into the theatre and that felt like a really lovely way to share all the things that have been exciting us about what Paul does. So it felt like a genuine, uh, lovely, fun collaboration for us in that respect. And, and so listening to Little Bulb talk about their enthusiasm, I suppose, kind of gives rise to the question, why whales? You know, in your experience, why is it that we humans are so preoccupied with this creature and fascinated by it? I mean, and, th and that is one of the fascinating questions. We, you know, it, I think it's undoubtedly true that whales have a particular 
place in human society and human culture, and why that should be is not clear. I mean, they are largely, superficially, just like large fish. Of course, they're mammals, but when you see them, they don't strike you as mammals, they're just big things. And whenever I've seen a whale, it sends a shiver up my spine, and I don't understand why. Even after, you know, you go to Madagascar for a few weeks, you see them every day, you might think, oh, yeah, well. <laughs> It doesn't happen. You still see one. If you ever see one breach, it's just unbelievable. And quite why that happens is something that I really don't feel I have a good handle on. And perhaps there's as many answers as there are people to ask the question Quite of. possibly. And so I suppose in summation for you guys, what do you feel like you've got out of the project? Have there been any unexpected outcomes for you or, or things you've taken away in particular? Um, I think it's been really nice for us to uh, use our strengths uh, or the, what we like doing in our practice with this kind of backdrop of hard scientific facts or slight twisting <laughs> of hard scientific <laughs> facts. Um, and hopefully it's been nice for Paul to see his kind of hard um, scientific research reflected back to him in kind of weird giant whale costumes and <laughs> ABBA songs. I don't know <laughs> if, if it has, I don't know. Um, and we, we, on some of our other projects, we often talk about something called, you know, character betrayal. You know, is the thing that my character is doing, is it a, does it logically fit with the overall feeling of the piece? But with this project, we had science betrayal. And we, were, we were kept on asking ourselves, well, that seems like a really fun idea, but that could just be terrible science. <laughs> um, and trying to avoid science betrayal, uh, really kept the dialogue alive. So, for example, we might be working on a scene. In fact, we were, where Claire and I were both playing whales. And uh, we, we'd come across a joke that we thought was quite funny, and then we'd have to ask ourselves, oh, hold on, I is that uh, got any grounding in science at all? <laughs> so we'd, we'd have to go uh, show Paul our little scene, and then, and then he, could, he could tell us exactly where we were diverging, and then he, he would give us some new information based on what we were doing, like this is how it could be a bit more accurate. Uh, and then that would prompt us to come up with some new material and there would be this back and forth, which is quite a, a new thing for us, but really helped us to learn more and develop more of the show. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> So these guys have to go off and get ready for their last performance of Whale this evening. So I'm going to say thank you to you, and thanks very much, Paul. Thank and thanks to all of you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.